Hello, welcome to Genesis chapter 22. We're slowing our pace down, looking at one of the most important verses in the entire scriptures. Genesis chapter 22, verse 2. And the reason we're slowing down to look at a couple of verses in great detail, yesterday with Genesis 22, verse 1, and now with 22, verse 2, is because of the importance of these verses to our understanding of the character of God, his relationship to humanity, including me, and specifically his relationship to Jesus Christ and how his sacrifice on the cross is an illumination of this text that we have in front of us today. Let me read the verse and hopefully you'll see. So Genesis 22, this is just verse 2. Then God said, Take your son, your only son, whom you love, Isaac, and go to the region of Moriah. Sacrifice him there as a burnt offering on a mountain I will show you. And so the reason that this text is critically important is because it's a demonstration of the call of God that seemingly is the opposite to his earlier call way back in Genesis chapter 12 and 15. In Genesis 12, it is absolutely obvious that God has called Abraham to renounce his past, his relinquishing his identity and embracing a new identity as the man and the family who will bring in the promises of God through his future children. So he's embracing a new identity with God Almighty as his God. Now it looks like he's asked to relinquish that future identity by the sacrifice of his son because he was just told in chapter 21 that it is through Isaac that the promise is going to be fulfilled. So how is this promise to be fulfilled when he is asked now to sacrifice this son as a burnt offering. The answer I think we'll find, and I won't go into it too much because we'll spend time on it in a week's time, is so interesting when we apply it to the Lord Jesus that the critical idea here is that Abraham knows firsthand that the promises of God will be true if only he trusts in him. In other words, he trusts that God will provide an answer to the apparent contradiction or conundrum that he has to sacrifice his son, but yet the promise will come through Isaac. God will provide, and in fact, that's what the text goes on to talk about, the provision of God. But just to come back to our verse today in Genesis 22, verse 2, what does it look like here to take this verse at face value? Well, firstly, it speaks clearly to the need for Abraham to trust in God's promises, even though on the surface or in the immediacy, they don't seem to be able to come true if we believe in the character of God. Now, it's not saying that God has told him a lie. Merely, I think what we're supposed to see here is that God has told him something that on the surface to his current level of understanding does not seem to be in accordance with God's promises nor character, but actually in the full scope of human history and Abraham's relationship with God, it will be seen that God's character was never going to be impinged or repudiated by the action of sacrificing his son at all, that God will provide. But God will provide once we begin to trust. And what we're trusting in is that God will keep true to his character and will demonstrate that character in due course when we're in a position to obey. And this is what we'll find in the second half of our text in the, in the days to come. The next part I think would be good for us to understand is a relationship of sacrifice and burnt offering. So the sacrificial system is brought into play because we deserve death when we sin against God. We do not deserve to be in his world, in his presence, because of our unholiness. And so the sacrificial system of animal sacrifice was brought in as a substitute in order to pay for the penalty that we could not pay. But God knew, and we know, that the blood of animals does not actually legitimately pay for the sin of man. And neither can really the blood of Isaac, because Isaac can't pay for the sin of Abraham, nor for the sin of himself, since he would be a sinner even as a young boy. But yet God has called this sacrifice and has asked Abraham to do it, because the burnt offering sacrificial system is a sacrifice of propitiation or substitute where God grants the sacrifice as pleasing to him because of the faith that went in to the actual sacrifice, the trust that you placed in this sacrifice. And God says, I tr place my 
a grace. I trust in that because I know that you are repentant, you are desiring to say sorry, and therefore God accepts that sacrifice we make because he is a gracious and loving God. And the burnt offering sacrifice is most beautifully seen in the New Testament through Jesus Christ. Now, hopefully, if those of you who are reading it know the New Testament well, you'll know some of those verses where they appear in our New Testament context, especially that first part. Take your son, your only son, whom you love. The essential nature of that verse where it says, your son, your only son, whom you love. And that doesn't that sound like God speaking of the Lord Jesus. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. Well, why? Why is that the case? Well, unlike Isaac, Jesus is sinless. And therefore, if he dies, he's, he's dying not to pay for the sin of himself, but for the sin of us. As Mark 10, 45 would say, Jesus came to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. He ransoms his life on the cross instead of our lives being taken from us by which we deserve based on our sin. Because a burnt offering, remember, is an atoning sacrifice. It pays for the sin of the person who does the sacrifice, and it does that by God granting that uh, grace of request that please take this animal as a substitute for me. Well, God says really that that doesn't work in the long term because I want my son to be the atoning sacrifice. And I'm going to give him and he's going to willingly take that sacrifice in order that we would see in him the sacrifice once for all. Another verse that you may remember, God died in Christ. He died, our God and Saviour Christ, in order that we would see in him the sacrifice once for all. As 1 John beautifully says, 1 John 4.10, a verse hopefully that you've read before, but if not, listen to this. This is love, it says. Not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. Isaac, Abraham, they need the Lord Jesus Christ to die for them. And so did we. And Jesus is that atoning sacrifice. He is the son, the eternal son of the father. He is God in the flesh who comes to sacrifice himself on the cross to die the death that we deserve but yet could not do to pay for our own sin that only he could pay. Isn't that amazing? In terms of our text today, it is a great test for Abraham of obedience, just like it was for Jesus Christ. He obeyed the Father, as it says in the New Testament, even to death, death on a cross. That level of obedience that Abraham showed and that level of faithfulness to his father that Isaac also displayed was absolutely displayed in Jesus Christ on the cross. That he went willingly, he went knowingly, and he went sinlessly to be the burnt offering, the fragrant sacrifice upon the cross that we needed and so richly can take with us in this life all the way to heaven.